Do you remember coming back from your last holiday and you pulled out these beautiful pictures you took of a landscape and someone said, one of your friends said, oh yeah, I've been there, I remember. What is it in the landscape that makes it so recognizable to us? This is a question that geomorphologists have been asking themselves for a long time and they try to understand what are the processes that form a landscape over geological time. Of course, it's not just for the pretty look of a picture. The surface of the Earth is often called by specialists in the field the critical zone. This is where we live, this is where we work, this is where our societies get most of the resources on which they depend. Water, food, minerals. The field of geomorphology has seen two major advances in recent years. One is due to dating techniques that we now have developed to actually constrain the rate at which a landscape forms over millions of years. The second one is computer modeling. This is what I do. I take equations, like the one I've shown you, and each term in that equation corresponds to a process that a geomorphologist is actually constrained by going in the field and measuring somewhere in one river the rate of incision of that river. And it's shown that it is actually proportional to the slope and also to the drainage area. That's the part of the landscape that drains in that location. It's that term in the equation here. Once a river incises into the landscape, it forms a valley, and along the size of the valley, other processes take place. This is the second term here. So we see that we have a redescription of the processes at every point of the landscape, and the computer models, what they do is integrate these equations to produce something that looks like a landscape. And you can see that we can predict the shape of a mountain, we can predict the spacing between valleys, we can predict the profile of a river as we go up the, 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 the mountain. One of the specialties of our group at the GFZ has been to develop highly efficient methods to solve this equation. We can solve it, we can represent the evolution of maybe 10 million years of Earth history in a mountain in typically 30 seconds on a laptop computer. Why do we need this extreme uh, efficiency in our methods? The reason is that the, the solution that we get are not unique. If I had a slight, slight small difference in the initial condition for that landscape, it would look different in the details. Its properties would be the same, but the details would be the different. And that's what happened also in the Earth. Many landscapes that are supposed to be exactly the same actually look very different just because of random processes in, in action. So how can we actually take a landscape and try to figure out how it was formed in the past through these computer models, under which tectonic settings or under which climate? Yes, climate matters. And I will show you later um, how, how it actually links with erosion. What I want to show you here is how we're actually using these models in what I call a Bayesian or an optimization scheme. What we take is this equation here, and we try to figure out what is the tectonic, this term here, or the climate, which really falls into this constant here for this very simplified equation. Of course, we use much more complicated equations, but to make the point, I will use this simplified equation here. How can we infer the value of these parameters from a, a real landscape? And to illustrate the point, I'm going to take a synthetic landscape, one I, that I've created with my model, but for which I know the value of these parameters. And I'm going to assume that I only know the final state of that landscape, and to describe it, because I told you there's a lot of variability, natural variability in this landscape, I'm going to assume that I know something that characterizes the landscape, but not in its details, like the distribution of height, slope of curvature. And then in this Bayesian method, what we do is we run a very large number of model experiments. In this case, I'm really going to run about 340 because it's a simple problem, it's a simple equation, and a simple thing to recover. But in reality, we may run these models over millions of instances to explore what we call parameter space. And then when we do this, we try for every experiment to compare the prediction that we make with what we're trying to reproduce. And this is what happens here. You know, it's done very, very rapidly on a small computer. And what we see here on the right, are each dot corresponds to one model instance. And the gray shading of the, no, the, the dot corresponds to how well it fits the observation of the, the, what we're trying to reproduce. And we see that very rapidly this method can converge to values that are estimates of the optimum value that represents the landscape you're trying to invert. We can also see that it, the, the solution converges to a range of value in a Bayesian framework, we say that we have mapped the uncertainty 
of our observation into the uncertainty of our model, the uncertainty of the parameters of the model estimates. Now, let me give you an example of how we have applied this method, for example, to recover the surface evolution of southern Africa. Southern Africa is very peculiar. It sits about a thousand meters above sea level, and there's no reason for it. There's no mountain that should be there. There's been no tectonic activity there for over a hundred million years. Yet, it sits up there. So what we've used is, of course, the shape of the present-day high-altitude plateau as a constraint that we want to reproduce, but also a whole range of very large amount of data that has been collected by geophysicists all around Africa through seismic sounding, but also a lot of data that geologists have collected on the continent. And we put all that data in our inversion scheme and now use a large computer or a cluster to actually try to reproduce the very long-term evolution of southern Africa. And what we show, I'm only showing you here the best fitting model, one thing that is quite certain from that inversion is that southern Africa, its anomalous topography is very old. It was created between 60 and 90 million years ago. And since then, it's basically remained static and has not evolved through time. What's also remarkable is that our model can reproduce this very peculiar aspect of southern Africa. It is very large basin, the watershed that corresponds to the Orange River, that seems to drain the entire continent or subcontinent. And you can see that the reason it's like that is because it's surrounded by what you would call a moat, a region of high elevation that funnels all the water into this large catchment. So our model can reproduce that, and we have explanation for why it happens like that and over which time scales. Now, I mentioned that climate plays a very important role. Well, take the example of a river in which there is like a boulder or a gravel there. If you go there on almost any given day, it looks very steady, nothing is happening, no erosion is taking place. But we can see that if the flow of the river increases by a factor 10, suddenly things are going to move. So in a river, what's really important is that we characterize the distribution of flow in the river. That is the frequency at which a, a given flow happens in that river. There are many rivers on Earth, and they have many different conditions of flow, driven by storms and other things in the atmosphere. So the only way we can actually include these in our models is by taking a statistical approach in which we condense all that data into a rule, it's a highly nonlinear rule, and using that, we've actually estimated that the variability in the river is extremely important, but only when the threshold, so the minimum flow that is needed to move material, is actually larger or equal, but mostly larger than the mean flow in the river. It still uh, points to the, the problem that we need to know the flow in the river, but what we're really interested in is how the climate, or climate of the past, and potentially the climate of the future, is actually driving erosion in, on Earth. And for that, we need to link the climate to the flow in the river. So again, statistical approach have been used to do this in, by members of my group. And one very interesting result that we came up, which is almost a byproduct of that approach, is to show that river, the mean flow of a river, is inversely proportional to the variability in the river. In other words, if I go to the, a large river like the Amazon, which is a very mean, large mean flow, the variability is very low. Whereas if I go in a mountain torrent, which has a very low mean flow, the variability is much higher. However, that relationship has been observed for decades now, but it's not very well constrained. You see, all the points should be sitting on that line, and there's a lot of dispersion. What we have actually shown is that it's the climate driver that is responsible for that uh, variability in this relationship, and it's mostly the storm intensity. So here we have a mean through our model to actually relate erosion, landsliding, river incision, to flow in a river to the climate. And this is extremely important, not only to study the past, so that we don't have to reconstruct the full climate history of the Earth to produce estimates of how it's being eroded over millions of years, but also it's useful to help us understand how the change that is actually, actually happening, happening today in our climate may affect uh, processes like not only the flow of rivers, but also the geomorphic response, the way mountains or high-relief environment react to that climate change. Now, I want to finish my presentation today by talking also about the links between landscape evolution and biodiversity. I'll take an example to illustrate my point from Madagascar, which is a very well-known hotspot of microendemism, as uh, uh, environmentalists say. What is microendemism? If we look at the distribution of lemur species, so these little monkeys who live in, in Madagascar, I don't think I can call them monkeys, but there are a lot of different species of lemur, 
they more or less occupy the same ecological niche, yet there are many different types of or species of lemur. And as you'll see, all these different species, the microendemism, only occur around the island. The big catchment or watersheds inside the island, which are perched high in the highlands of the island, do not show that endemism. In other words, there are a few lemur species that live everywhere, and especially in these catchments. So there seems to be a link between the shape of the landscape and the biodiversity. This is true for lemur, this is true for plants, it's true for most mammals and other animals in Madagascar. What's really interesting too is that if you look at these so-called phylogenetic trees, it tells us the time in which speciation took place in the past. And what's really fascinating is to see the time scale here that the different species of lemur didn't happen yesterday or a few thousand years ago. It happens over the whole geological evolution, or geomorphological evolution of the island, since it was separated from Africa and India. So there is really a co-evolution of the landform and the biodiversity. And one of the essential ingredients is to understand why Madagascar has this very specific distribution of watersheds these low altitude connected to the ocean watersheds versus these high altitude uh, that covers a much larger altitudinal, altitudinal range. And to understand how we can create that on an island, which is not the case for many other islands, like for example Sri Lanka, same latitude roughly, but doesn't have this microendemism not so well developed, we must look actually at what happens deep in the earth. Here I'm going to use very simple models, three of my landscape evolution models, in which I'm going to take into account the rebound of the Earth. When you erode a mountain, the Earth actually rebounds, a bit like an ice cube in a glass of whiskey or an iceberg in the ocean. If you erode the top, it rebounds. It's called isostasy. On a small island, like maybe Sri Lanka, the rebound takes place mostly in the middle of the island. So that if I run one of these models, what I'll see is I create a ridge in the middle of the island over which all the watershed will be constructed, going from the boundaries of the island to the summit. If the island is very large, then the rebound takes place mostly along the edges of the island, and you create a single watershed with a single river in the middle. This is very similar to what we see, for example, for the Orange Basin in southern Africa. Whereas, if you are in, like in Madagascar, where we are in the middle of these two extremes, we do create these large watersheds that are stuck in the middle of the island in high altitude. And we believe this is one of the main cause for the specific microendemism and biodiversity of Madagascar. A link between life at the surface of the earth, the way it evolved, and the deep earth uh, the at the lithospheric scale, at the scale of a hundred of kilometers inside the earth. So I will conclude by stating that, yes, we do need to understand the long evolution of the Earth, and especially of the Earth's surface of a million, millions of years, not only because it's fascinating, but of course because we also need it to understand what we are actually doing to this system by changing the climate of the Earth. We need to understand the natural variability in that system before we can even pinpoint what we are doing to that system and hopefully do something to fix it. Thank you very much. <clears throat>